Good question. Any other questions? JP. On uh, the side of Christians viewing homosexuality as you know, the worst sin, uh, many Christians take the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah out of context to say that uh, the reason that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah is because of homosexual acts. Can we speak to that and why it's out of context? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, good, good question. Um, there are six. <laughs> there are six references to um, same-sex relations, homosexuality. Genesis 19 is one of those six that does not count because it really has nothing to do um, with just same-sex relations. It was. It's, it has to do with gang rape. Um, so you can't. Number one, it's a terrible thing. And and if you look um, in the scriptures, actually, I had it written, written down. The judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality. It was actually the. Um, it was the ignoring of hungry and needy people and people living in um, great, um, they, had, they had abundance and they neglected those who had need. That, that's the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, pride. Um, and it's, I think it's in Ezekiel, I could give you the scripture where it talks about um, the sin of, of Sodom and Gomorrah and why it was judged. Um, so there's, there's only five other ones that actually do, and, and they do, I mean, they do Genesis, I mean, uh, Leviticus, um, 18 and 20, um, and then, of course, you know the Romans and, and then 1 Corinthians and those. And the, good, the, the part about them, though, is they're very clear, and even starting in Genesis 1 and 2, um, when you look there and you look at Adam and Eve and, and God making Eve as a, um, a, a sufficient helpmate, a, a good helpmate, um, even in the fact the words that are used there, uh, means that the only the only right kind or good kind of helpmate for Adam was someone who was like him but opposite of him, and even in the in the Greek wording, um, that that was the it, it wouldn't just be another human. It had to be a human who was like him but opposite or anti him, and that's what Eve was. So beginning from there, then Jesus referencing that in divorce, that it's only about these two, who from creation were created to be together. There there's a lot of good scripture to back up the fact that God is pro-heterosexual um, is not, not necessarily a problem. But the thing going back to Genesis, not, I mean, the, the uh, yeah, Genesis 19 scripture about Sodom and Gomorrah, is there six, there's six scriptures about homosexuality. There's 2,000 scripture references to neglecting the poor. So when we, if we use those to point at people, we've got to be very careful because we live in America, the richest country in the world, and we all have way more than what we need. And so we can be hypocritical by using those verses to point out if we're not super careful to realize that what Scripture has to say about all these other things. And people can point that out to us. So we've got to take all of that, all of Scripture into consideration, the whole thing, not just ones about, about homosexuality. But, but, but they're, they're there, and, and life is like, um, she was telling you that it is, it's good it's a good idea to get some hermeneutics on those scriptures, to read them and learn them and learn why um, scripture does teach um, male and female relationships are the ones that God started from creation and, and is still promoting. Um, and they go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. They're repeated. That's another reason that we continue to follow things as Christians if they're listed there and listed in the New Testament. Um, and so, and it seems too that Jesus, um, when you talk about the silence argument, that Jesus didn't have a New Testament, and we know he was the Word. We could get into all that, but he, his Bible was the Old Testament Bible. He was a Jew, and he would have followed what, what Jews would have followed, and they automatically followed and knew that God had created man and woman to be a marriage. So he, he, that's, again, why he wasn't having to speak into that like you were saying. He already knew that. They already knew that. that was, that's what was going on. So hope that answers on the, the Sodom and Gomorrah question maybe. That's not a good one to use. So there's other ones, though. Hey, Asim, go ahead. Go ahead. I moved the mic out for a reason. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Will? Just kind of going back to the, the question of uh, kind of how we interact with openly gay couples and supporting them in various things. And somebody said something earlier in the discussion about, and I don't remember the words that were actually used, but they're not looking for whether you're like it or I can't remember, but they're looking for whether you're human. And so my question, I guess, is uh, kind of to Veronica's question earlier about whether or not to attend the shower uh, and then 
and somebody else brought up the if you're a, you know if you're a florist do you not deny to uh, you know do business with a gay couple that's you know get flowers for their wedding where let me put it, the question to you this way if you were a florist and a gay couple approached you about doing flowers for their wedding and I would like to hear an uh, answer to each of the panelists if that's all right would you Sell, sell to them, and why and why not? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> for the ease of... I'll, I'll tell you where I stand on it. Um, I personally would sell them flowers. Why and why not? <laughs> yeah. I would sell them the flowers uh, because... Uh, making that stand, I, 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 okay, I'm trying to, I, I don't, I don't want to sound as, uh, well, anyway, let's just talk. Uh, okay, so, so, uh, I would sell them the flowers, and the reason I would sell them the flowers is, is for, for a couple of reasons. First reason is, um, I, I, I opened a business to sell flowers, so I would sell flowers. Um, uh. Had they not told me it was for a gay wedding, I'd have sold them flowers, no problem. They tell me it's for a gay wedding, and my business is to sell flowers. I sell flowers to everybody. By me selling them flowers does not mean I support gay marriage. So if I stand there and say I will not sell flowers to you because you're gay, that rings to me of certainly not loving people. Uh, if I do a jam-up job with flowers in their wedding, uh, then maybe we can talk later. Maybe, maybe the door's open. Uh, but to stand there, and I want to be careful with this, it does ring of a sort of bigotry. I, and I, I don't think that race issues and homosexual issues are the same. I think that's a, a, a false argument. But it does lend to a, uh, a not trying to understand, a f almost a fear of people who are gay. So because it is my business, I would practice that business in such a way that anyone who wanted to give me money is free to give me money, and, and I will do the business that I set out to do. Plus tips. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's why I would. I just don't think that's the right way to make your stand. So, I probably would have not sold the flowers, but I've been convinced. <laughs> <coughs> we have a convert. All right. There we go. I actually was a florist at one time <laughs> before this became an issue uh, in my heart it would be very difficult but after hearing Asa <laughs> I would have to reconsider <laughs> probably <laughs> for the reason of having a way to speak into their life in the future um, yeah I mean it, it Personally, ugh. but because it goes against everything I believe, but for the sake of the person and the reason I'm here and I'm making this up as I go because I'm just now thinking about this, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm here to show the love of Christ and we're talking flowers. Now, there's other situations might be different. I'm still trying to think of that. Um, you know, like I say, as a pastor, if I were a pastor, I'm not a pastor. I don't think I could marry a gay couple. You know, I mean, selling flowers. that's exactly what I'm saying. So, I mean, there, there's a line there. Uh, but in just selling flowers, that's a way of, of building relationship. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. So I think I'm going to leave it there. But I do defend the right of the florist who sure. chooses not to. Yeah, I, did, I might disagree, but you run your business how you want. Right. If you don't want to make money, you don't have to make money. Right. There you go. All right, Tom, it's up to you. Settle the score. It's flowers. I worked in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> do I really need to elaborate on this? <laughs> I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Sounds I'm, like you're I'm, dodging. I'm, 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 I'm shocked because this conversation kind of came up over our dinner, so I'm, I'm going to ask it in a different way. Would you buy flowers from a gay florist for your wedding? We did. Yeah. 
So, 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 uh, yeah, be, be, uh, you know, again, when you, when you have that. That's my wife, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you got, you put the shoe on the other foot. Yeah, you know, you got, you've got to look at it from that aspect. He well. was a great, great florist. I, how do I you bought a house. Oh, sorry, Kim. How sorry. do you know? We knew. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nuances. <laughs> I bought a house. I bought a house from a um, a gay realtor, and I actually picked him on purpose. Um, number one, he was a wonderful realtor. Number two, it gave me a amazing opportunity to witness to him um, because my house took a year to sell, and he would call and say, "I can't believe you haven't called and cussed me out. I can't believe you haven't snapped and screamed at me and hollered and all that." And so every time I would say, "Bart, it's because Jesus has changed me." And he let me talk to him about Jesus. And he still, to this day, comes by the house sometimes and talks to us. Um, and so, I, there again, like Ken said, it's an opportunity, you know. Hi, Mr. Thomas, I believe your name is. Would yeah. love an elaboration, and I'll tell you why. Um, I was thinking, well, you know, this, this florist example, it's very easy, yeah, I mean, so, okay, what's something more thicker? We're dealing with a sin issue, and um, in talking about it specifically with homosexuality, um, I think the principles should apply. If I'm wrong, please tell me. But if it's a sin issue, I think the principles should apply. So do we sell liquor to alcoholics? I was a maintenance man at a bar. <laughs> See, there's a way around all those things. Yeah. Um, well, I said, you know, there's the whole trick of being a Christian and a bar owner. That's the first little thing you got to deal with before you worry about selling liquor to alcoholics. So that, that's a whole other thing you have to deal with. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions in there whether a follower of Jesus could own a place that sells alcohol to people knowing the effects of alcohol. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot more than... What's that? My question is enabling. And so if, if you are too, it's like the supporting question. Well, if you're convicted, then don't go to the shower. So it's like, well, if you don't go to the shower, then you don't have that window of opportunity, potentially, to be in their life still. And so you don't sell them flowers, and you don't have that opportunity. You don't welcome them to the bar, you don't have that opportunity. You don't, yeah, I mean, we're all sinners, so thus you own a bar. But it doesn't make you not a Christian. What do you do? It's a, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a principle thing. It's a enabling question. A supporting question, and I don't. Um, I just I still go back to the fact that I say that a lot of businesses you can own and say you're walking with Jesus, but because of the element, the the core of what a bar is, is really tricky for you. most people I know that come to Jesus who own a bar typically sell it. I mean that's what typically happens when somebody does that. So I mean it's different. You're working in it. You're not owning it, or you're not even you know even the serving liquor thing. I mean you could even get into that and, and talk about that as a possibility but like I said the fact of, of owning a flower shop is, is diff, much different core element of why you're making money than owning a bar that's, there's, they're, they're, that's on a whole different level I mean there's not even apples and apples right there I mean they're, they're, biz, they're businesses but that's about the only thing no I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what you're, what you're wanting to hear so why it's it's okay to support in some instances and not in the others because God looks at it as a sin. And we look at it and say, well, you know, giving flowers is cool, but, um, you know, I mean, I don't know. There's no other example, but it is all sin. Are we recognizing it's not all sin? No. I, th I, think, I think what, if I'm understanding your question right, Mikey. We love you, man. We love you. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I would say selling liquor to someone you know is an alcoholic, you're right, that's enabling. Selling flowers for someone to have a gay wedding, that wedding will happen whether you got flowers or not. That, that, that wedding will happen whether they got a cake or not. Uh, whether they got a dress or not. I tell people that all the time when I do their wedding. I was like, you know, you're going to spend a lot of money on a dress and cake and all kinds of stuff, but I'm telling you, there's one thing necessary for this wedding. Me. You know, because I'm enabling you to get married. 
<laughs> you know, I, I'm doing that. I'm officiating. Uh, and so I would sell someone flowers for a wedding, but I would not officiate a gay wedding. You see, one's, one's uh, crucial and enabling, and the other's not. Is that where God draws the line? Does the Bible speak on anything that might answer this question that I don't even know how I'm asking a is is sin sin is the question yeah check back in the fall for <laughs> yeah yeah sin, sin is sin um we're gonna we're gonna be engaged in sin in this world we live with sin we're not we're not without it we, we deal with it on a regular basis um we deal with it in others we are harmed by it all the time uh, we harm others with ours all the time um so uh as best I can tell. Are, are you asking, like, if would Christ sell the flowers? Is that what uh, you're... No, not really. <laughs> okay, why don't we do this? Why don't, why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we do this? Uh, think about it. Formulate it. Come back. Oh, God, come back. Oh, but wait. Let's, let's go to one other question first, and we'll come back. Yeah, Jonathan. Basically, uh, there's two types of people. Not, okay. Basically, there are two groups of practicing homosexuals. Uh, in my thinking here, uh, you've got one group of practicing homosexuals who recognize that Christianity is opposed to it, and they're okay with that. They they accept it. They don't go to church. They have nothing to do with God necessarily. And you got another group that will still choose to identify as Christian while practicing homosexual lifestyle. And so um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, when dealing with the issue of the man who was sleeping with his mother in law, um, he says to remove him from the church. He says, and I, and I, I tell you not to have anything to do with the sexually immoral. Not at all talking about the sexually immoral of this world, but those who claim the name of the brother. And so, so as, as I've been sort of reflecting on the, the, the shower issue, uh, you know, the, the deal of, of not having a meal with somebody who claims to be a brother and is sexually immoral, uh, from what I understand, means that, that, that you'd be reinforcing an idea that Christ approves by your presence, by your cordial fellowship. Um, and so, if it were a, a, a uh, you know, a wedding shower for a same-sex couple that thought they were believers, or claimed to be believers, or were still fighting for that identification as a believer, I would not go to that shower for the, for the sake of not wanting to reinforce uh, Christ's approval on, on, on the trip. But if it were somebody who was in the other category that says, we completely reject the, the silly notion that you can be practicing homosexual and still a Christian, if it was that couple, I'd probably go. If, if they were a friend. Am I right on that? Or, or does, that, does, does that apply? That issue, that principle applies to this issue. I think it does. I think you're right. Yeah. I think it's right, right on, <clears throat> right on the mark. Yeah, and I, I think the reason for that is uh, when, when someone by their actions would, would cause harm to the gospel, um, or. You know, what's, what's interesting about that argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is he says, by no means do I mean that you should disassociate from the world. Otherwise, you have to leave the world. But, but it is for brothers. So I think, and, and in, that's in the context of the gathering, the body of believers. And so that gets us into the issue of what we should do as far as church discipline and those kinds of things um, in a church. And I think as a church, the, the pillar and buttress of truth that when someone who makes a confession of Christ, but their life does not match that confession, then as a church, you must, you must stand against that and practice.
practice Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, and remove the brother. So you remove fellowship and you say, uh, we cannot confirm your confession of Christ. So we won't do anything that would lend credibility to your confession to Christ. And, and I think that's absolutely vital. And I think we should do that for all kinds of sins. We were, we were given a, uh, a blog post about um, how, how many churches pick on homosexuality but not divorce. Okay, because Jesus speaks against divorce and, and the Bible speaks against divorce. Uh, and, and I think you have to practice that in both cases. So, for instance, uh, in our church, um, we've had two cases of church discipline where we've had to remove someone or we're leading up to move, removing someone once and then once removing someone. So the first instance or the second instance was uh, someone living with another person engaged in in premarital sex and that sort of thing, did not want to move out, did not want to change their mind. We came to them individually in a group, took it to the church, ultimately no repentance. We removed them from membership of the church, okay? That's not over homosexuality. That's over your run-of-the-mill fornication, okay? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> But the first one was on the issue of divorce, which the church has largely been silent about, especially because it's so prevalent. Um, uh, we had a man who wanted to leave his wife because he wasn't happy. There was no infidelity or anything of that nature. Uh, and so we went to him and said, read to him, showed him in Scripture what the Bible said about it. He said he agreed with it. And, and so and my conversation was, said, so you're going to still pursue with the divorce? He said, yes. So then we brought other men in, and he came to that meeting, surprisingly. He came to that meeting and we pleaded with him and we prayed with him and we reinforced those scriptures and he said, I see them, I understand them, but I am just not happy and doesn't want God want me to be happy. So we dealt with all of that and that whole thing. He left that meeting and said he's going to still pursue divorce. So I called him and I said, we're going to take this to the church. We're going to make it known in our next members meeting. And he said, I strongly disagree. And I said, you would. You would disagree. Uh, I, I could imagine you would. But then we decided we can't do that yet because he had not gone and done it. He had not filed for divorce. It was all talk at this point. So we held off. They reconciled and are still married today. Now they left our church because I, I, embarrassment or whatever, but, but they're still married. We count that as a win. So I think the church can't single out homosexuality and say, if you're homosexual, we're kicking you out. But I think the church does need to step up in all areas of places where our confession of Christ does not match our life and warn brothers and plead for them to come back and then if they still continue to defame Christ and live a, a, against their confession to remove them I think that's absolutely necessary uh, and so I think what your the, the nuance that you've put there between someone who uh, uh, presents himself as Christian and gay versus someone who is gay but either never was a Christian or just realizes those things don't go together um, then, then I think that nuance is right. So the one who professes Christ, you would be less involved with. The one that doesn't, you could be more involved with, which almost seems counterintuitive, but that's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, yeah, Rhonda. Just to clarify, you are talking about members, correct? Like yes. People, because you wouldn't have your Sure, I don't think you do that. Um, I, I think the only way that a church affirms a confession of Christ is through membership. So if someone who is presenting gay and Christian wants to come to our church and sit here and never join our church and, 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 and come to community night and enjoy the fellowship and all those things, amen and welcome. Uh, but when it comes to membership, we're going to talk about what following Christ means. 
And if you're not willing to do that, then we keep, then we would withhold membership. Is that yeah. okay? Correct. Um, in discipleship, we are um, talking about the life of David, and um, David mentioned that Jonathan's love for him was stronger than a woman, and I would just like y'all interpretation. The, the the death David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they had a covenant relationship. They had a strong bond. The gay community will use that and say they had a homosexual relationship. I don't believe that. Um, nowhere does it give any implication of that. They had a strong friendship. Uh, that's the way I see it. Just a normal reading of the text would not bear out a homosexual relationship. And you have to be very creative in your interpretation to get that. And so take that a step further. I think there are many male-on-male relationships in the church that are hindered because they fear this issue. And I think we need more relationships like Jonathan and David who genuinely love one another. Um, do you think it was of any that you said that it was more than a woman. I... See, what happens in America is we automatically read that as sexual because everybody in America, or a lot of people in America, and this is why homosexuality is so huge, identifies themselves with sexuality because our media, our culture, our movies, everything is so over-sexualized. See, if David and Jonathan were talking about that, sex wasn't even on the border. In Western America, that's all you think about. Very different filter that you're looking through. So that, that's the whole difference in the two is like they wouldn't have been, these guys wouldn't have been talking about or thinking or having anyone know if that were what it was. It never would have said that um, if that were what it was because it would have been, it would have been bad. Um, they, they wouldn't have been around when somebody found that out. So um, yeah, it would, it would not have ended well. And I know in high school, I ran with a bunch of boys that were closer to me than any other girl in high school. They knew me better. They knew things about me my mama didn't know, you know? Um, That's what she wanted you to think. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, there was, a, there was a sense in which we loved one another more than any of the other women, you know, um, uh, that, that were around, except our mamas. Uh, well, and that changed when we got married. That changed when we got married. Um, we don't love each other more than that. But I think that's what it speaks about, that kind of relationship, that kind of camaraderie um, that is, in a, in a lot of cases, what a lot of men miss out on today, which is a kind of love uh, between males that is uh, sh very strong, very mm -hmm. strong. So, Question? Yes. Not a question, but just to say devil's advocate, even if it were, I mean, I don't believe that it was, that that was the meaning of it, but even if it were, like Melinda said, there are same-sex attractions that people struggle with, like anything, any sin that a person struggles with. So even, just devil's advocate, not saying I believe that, but even if it were, it still could stand as a good story and a true story and a, a testimony as if he were attracted to him but didn't act because the, the attraction is not the sinful part per se it's the action it's taking action with that attraction oh i wasn't saying that oh, i believe it was a <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. You're just saying that that's, that, but that's brought up in you, so it's good to bring that up because that is appointed. That and then the centurion one, which there again, you've got to make not just stretches, but leaps and jumps to try to make that happen. Um, so it's good to bring that up because that will be, that will be brought up. We call that hermeneutical, hermeneutical gymnastics. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that adds to this question of. I don't think he made people gay. 
I think people are born with different kinds of tendencies, mostly because of the sinful world we live in. I don't think he made people gay, and that's my own personal opinion. For me, I can only speak to myself because that's what I experienced. Um, for whatever reason, and I've searched all kinds of ways, and I've found a few things that uh, might have triggered those things. Um, but like I said, regardless, God has still spoken about it, and he will give me the power to overcome it. You know, And that humbling myself in that way will draw me closer to him. So whatever we're facing, he's going to use that to draw us closer to him. Uh, I personally don't believe he made anybody gay. The scriptures tell us that before we came to Christ, we were weak, we were depraved, we were dead, we were enemies of God. So all of us have the latent capacity to commit the most horrible sin, whatever you want to call it, what whatever that sin is that you identify as the worst sin, you have the capacity because you're a human being. You're a sinner by nature and by choice. That's the way we are. And until we are made right in Christ, that's the way we will stay. Our only freedom is in Christ. And when God created man, he did not create them sinful. When man rejected God's rightful rule over them, all men fell into sin. So that's not the way God made us, but that's the way that we are born by nature and, because and I, we're in Adam. And I think something that our, 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 our teaching team at, in Mandeville came up as we understood the scriptures in Romans 5 this week, we understood that it's, it's more, more, than, more than original sin. It's actually original death. We are dead. Paul said in, in Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then you were made alive in Christ. There's, there's, it's death or life. And that's, that's the difference. But on that note, I would like to say that all of us have something. And all of us are tempted by something, besetting sins. And just like Jessica said, let's go on, Jenny, no. Um, you know, the temptation is not the sin. We all are tempted by different things. It's the acting on that temptation, the playing around with that temptation. Uh, and there's a verse, and y'all can probably tell me that, you know, one leads, and eventually it leads to death. Uh, there you go, James. And, uh, you know, so just because we're tempted with something doesn't mean we have to follow that to its end. You know, God is there to help us stop. You know, he's, he gives us the power to run, to flee, to whatever. It's us that give in because of our weakness, because of our needs, because of whatever. But he does give us the power to overcome those sins, uh, those temptations. Um, which is why I said about the humility, I can't do it on my own. He gives me the power to overcome the temptations. The temptations may come, Satan likes, he knows the buttons to push, and he will come. I mean, if someone has a problem with gambling, I don't personally have that. I don't really understand that problem, but they do, and I can walk along and say, well, I may not understand that. You were talking about it being an addiction. Lots of things we deal with are like addictions. The, some people have food addictions. Ooh, I might have stepped on somebody's toe. Um, <clears throat> you know, we just, we, we don't want to talk about that one. Um, but we, those are addictions. And we, we need help, and we need to encourage each other to overcome those things, to rely on the Spirit of God in us to overcome those things. And I forgot the original question. But anyway, y'all got that for free. I want to pause for one second. Uh, we've got more questions. It is after 8.30. Uh, and just to make you aware, if you need to leave, feel free to go. Same for the panelists, if you've got to leave. But uh, I'm, we're going to continue the conversation. Uh, we, 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 yeah, we're going over time on this one. Uh, but, uh, uh, but feel free, if you, if you need to leave, go ahead. Uh, uh, just for several of your reference, the biblical references regarding homosexuality, 
people who may not know those, could you give those out? Tom, you Leviticus, to... Leviticus 18 and 20, uh, of course, listed there with a lot of other sexual sins. Um, that's that's a, kind of the first two, because I said the Genesis 19, you can't really make apply. Um, so Leviticus 18 and 20, I don't tell you the exact. 18 um, 22. There you go. Um, so that's the first place that you're going to find it. And then, of course, you're going to jump forward to Romans 1. <coughs> yeah. Leviticus 20:13 as well. Yes, 20:13. 8 that's 18 and, and 20. And then you, but you, the thing is you're seeing you see those all of those sexual laws that are listed there um, in in form are all repeated those exact ones are repeated in the New Testament. Um, so that's that's kind of the what backs it up is that you see it Old Testament and New Testament um, repeated. And then there's uh you'll quote it while I go first first Corinthians 6 9 9 through 11 and then uh, first Timothy, first Timothy 1 yeah. 8 through 10. Jesus spoke on the issue of sin, uh, of sexual sin in Mark 7, 20 through 23 and Matthew 10, 11 through 13. He didn't specifically mention uh, homosexuality, but he uses the word pornea, which, um, which includes all forms of sexual sins. So he, uh, he addressed the topic without naming it specifically in those passages. Back to Mikey. Back to Mikey. <laughs> I consulted my partner. <laughs> and um, what I am looking for is if the Bible gives a two questions. Also, this there's a follow up question. You ready for that? Um, from Nash Asa. So, is there a. Is there a blanket catch-all statement for um, the same thing that the floors thing and the, the bar thing or the selling guns to murders thing, or, like, I don't know, um, to, to being a part of someone's life on their path to sin and just being a part of it for the sake of being a witness. Um, is there a blanket catch-all when uh, it's like, oh, at this point you're enabling, at this point you're not, um, or is it conviction only? Or is it somewhere between? When we don't know what to do, we have this person. His name is the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and I, I know you're thinking I'm copping out, but I'm saying on these things, a lot of things are not written rules. Jesus is not trying to get us to live by rules. He's trying to get us to be new people of the kingdom, changed from the inside out, sensitive to those things. And so there are things that are blatantly, like you were saying, right and wrong, but I don't know in those cases, and I think Asa did a good job explaining this earlier, about our conscience and about the Holy Spirit um, listening and it, and it being some of those times that we have to really be able to do that to know when is enabling, when is participating, and when is it, when is it not. You're just in, you're in the world because you're called to be in it because you have to be a light. Lights are no good in the lighthouse. They have to go out into the darkness to be light. And so you've, you've got to defer and trust in the Holy Spirit in those times and know, you, you know, you may not be perfect at it all the time. I mean, I, I, those days when you have more in the win, thank you, Lord, column than in the I messed up column, victory. Um, but I, I don't, I, and these guys may think differently, I don't think there is a blanket way to have that. I, I, think, I think the Lord wants us to, to fall on him and trust in him and walk with him. I think... Yeah, I think I think the way that the Bible instructs us in that is in matters of wisdom. This these are wise things to do. These are unwise things to do. And then we, uh, based on the situations we're in, because the Bible the Bible doesn't give us answers to every situation we're going to face, but it does give us general principles that will guide us. And so we submit ourselves to the wisdom of God, and we do our best, you know, trusting in the Holy Spirit. Yep. There, was there a second question? Yep. Uh, as kind of a justification to your previous answer, not being a crucial part as in the pastor of a wedding versus the hander of the drink or something like that. So I'm wondering, is the Bible silent on being a crucial part to sin? Does it clarify, or is that the same answer, conviction, wisdom, etc.? Because you, you brought up this phrase, and I wonder where it came from, being a crucial part of sin versus not. 
Yeah, I, I was speaking as to enabling. So someone selling flowers is not the, the key that makes a wedding happen. But someone officiating and declaring by authority of the state and of God that they're married is essential. Uh, I can't think of a specific verse that says, uh, uh, other than we should be innocent of evil. Um, uh, so. Sounds like conviction. I mean, that, can I just speak to it for a second? Yep. I think the hardest, I mean, sure, the Bible talks about not being a stumbling block. It speaks specifically not being a stumbling block to children. It talks about us not using our liberty um, in vain or, or causing someone else to sin by that. But it does at some point come down to the Holy Spirit's conviction because anything you do, what you have on today may cause somebody else to stumble, even though I think it's modest. I mean, you know, like, are you never going to go to any football game ever again because somebody there is probably going to get mad at the football game and cuss? Are you never going to eat at any restaurant ever again because somebody's going to talk to their wife ugly at the restaurant? Or do you not go to any, if you don't believe alcohol is right, do you go to, not go to any grocery store that sells alcohol? You know, there comes a point where we just have to follow the Holy Spirit's conviction in our life. I feel like they would say, if you feel like you're, what you're doing is going to cause someone else's sin, then obviously don't do that. You know, but I don't think there's a catch-all verse that's going to just solve everything. But don't be a stumbling block and you have to take that interpretation daily as you you know yeah. as you would with anything so else. it sounds like the answer is not only conviction but also responsibility yes Good. yes I think that's good thank you As we we'll ponder. put the ignorant first. How's that? I don't, <laughs> um, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I mean, I know. I think there. I think they could be two different things there. But um, did the, with the police chief, um, maybe he didn't know that that was going to happen. But I got a feeling he probably had a clue that that could happen. Um, so going into those kind of situations and and um, going into that kind of forum um, and and basically having church or doing Bible study in a place like that, I mean, you realize you, you, those things could come. And so I say, like you, I, I'm with you. I say, you, you say, okay, I'll go find a different job and you go on. Um, that, that's me. But I said, that could be different for everybody. On the one with the mayor, um, that clearly crossed a line that can't be crossed. Yeah, because that illegal. that's in a church and she has no business with that. 
um, she she crossed a line she can't cross or she's not supposed to cross and that's I mean that's going against you know like I said that the church the church is not a place where this the state comes in and regulates we we have that um, so I, I don't know to me it's kind of two two different things mm -hmm. I think um, but on the one with the fire chief I know everybody's got a different opinion if it was me I would just say I understand and I'll I'm going to go find another job. Um, somebody else might be answering completely different, but that, that's just me. Yeah, I was going to say, I might push back on that a little bit in that, um, you know, I see an example of Paul using his Roman citizenship to gain a hearing with uh, Rome um, when he was in uh, the, the, the jail in Corinth. Uh, so I would say if we have legal rights, legal recourse, two reasons I might pursue it. I might pursue it, one, uh, because uh, there was an injustice done, so we stand by injustice. Now, I'd be careful and not try to sue him for a bazillion dollars, but I might say all I really want is, is the, the pay that I lost so that I might uh, you know, not, not have harm for writing something that I believe. And I think that's okay for that reason. And then the other reason I think it might be okay is because it sets a precedent. Uh, if we allow uh, the freedoms that we currently have to be stripped away, if we allow it, if we just say, you know, I'm just going to, no big deal on that one, you know, all right, you know, you're bad, I'll take that one on the chin. We set a precedent for people to come behind us. So I think while we have the right, we exercise the right so that others behind us may not come into the same kind of harm. However, um, when those rights are stripped away, we don't just wail and cry and flip-flop and decide we're not going to follow Christ or something like, like that. We just recognize that that is a right we no longer have, so we cast ourselves upon, upon Christ and take what comes. But while we have the rights, we exercise the rights, I think. In the case of the mayor, you have separation of church and state. The state has no business telling the church what to do. Uh, that's just, that's been a long-standing thing, uh, and so uh, we don't have state churches, and so her demand to do that uh, was, was out of order. Now, we may get to a point where churches don't have those freedoms anymore, mm -hmm. and so then someone can manuscript my sermon out for me because I don't do it and, and give it to them. <laughs> be fine, <laughs> you know? Uh, so. Good questions. The fact that he's a pastor in French Quarter brings up an experience that I had with my children down this past summer. We were down in the French Quarter and just standing in front of St. Louis Cathedral listening to musicians, and there is this fellow out there who had a tutu on and very minimal underwear, that's all I'm going to say. His name is Big Sexy. <laughs> 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 but I have a five-year-old, and at first he didn't notice, and he looks over and he's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm just going to sit here and listen to music. And I'll tell you what, when I sit here and listen to music, I'm not at the point where I'm ready to explain what my five-year-old, what heterosexual attraction is, how do I, as a parent, disciple my child with the cultural atmosphere that we're in today? And I know Ms. Melinda... First, I was going to say, don't take them to the French Quarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It ain't no kids' park. No. That just means you can see it better. So <laughs> <laughs> They don't have an off switch. Yeah. yeah. But seriously, I... Besides not taking him to the French Quarter, you never tell a child more than what he asks exactly, you know, especially the young ones. Say, that's the way he likes to dress. We don't dress that way, but that's the way he likes to dress, and we'll talk about it more later, you know. My, my, my question is, is, how do we disciple our children in the cultural atmosphere today where it's getting very you know, very much in well, I mean, that's that again. That's kind of what I'm saying. I mean, like, like when I was raised, 
my children, I mean, they're almost all out of the house now. Uh, another issue, I mean, because this wasn't a big issue when, I, when they were younger. It's getting more and more now. Uh, but like other religions and, and other and like occultic stuff, you know, um, I homeschooled them so that I was, you know, doling out to them what they were going to be getting. And, but I didn't want to hide them. I wanted to expose them to things of the world, but I didn't want to do it too soon, certain things. So I would, if something came up or if they asked me a question, I would actually just say exactly what answered their question depending on their age, and then move on. And I would reiterate it with saying, this is what some people do, but this is what God told us to do. And this is why we don't do that. I mean, like, we don't drink. We, we've never, we don't drink alcohol in our house. We just never have. But some people do. And I'm like, you know, this is what the Bible says. It doesn't say you can't drink. It says don't get drunk. We don't do it just because we choose not to, but they can or whatever you know so it's just kind of taking each issue now this particular one it it's difficult it is um you know because everywhere you look there's sexual images in the grocery line i mean my goodness you're having to like cover their eyes all the time but you can say you know just in as simple terms as you can especially for a five-year-old you know just say this is what some people do but this is not what God wants us to do, you know, that sort of thing. And so just kind of give it, dole it out to them as they can handle it. Um, one kind of extreme case for me, not in this particular issue, but my daughter, my oldest daughter came home and had heard a curse word that was pretty, pretty serious curse word. And, you know, we don't talk like that. Well, she wanted to know what it meant. I told her what it meant. She was 13. 12, 13. And so to satisfy her curiosity, guess what we did? We went through every single word I could think of that was something she would probably hear and said, that's what this is. That's what this is. That's what that means. Just very dictionary, very sanitary, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is what this means. And that's why we don't use it because God said this. God said not for us not to do this, this, and the other. And it's like, she was just like, oh, and then we went on you know, and so, but she was 13, you know, so we just kind of took it, and it was very, very sterile, very, you know, um, that's the way I parented my children, I don't know, it's, this is a very, very different culture, mm -hmm. it's changing every day, and uh, I'm gonna pray for y'all, <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, it's, it's very difficult, but I, but just, a general rule is just not to tell them more than they can handle at the, at the time. Just to piggyback off that, because I do live in such a sexual neighborhood, <clears throat> I know that there are some good, and you might talk to your pastor, some good um, discipling tools starting at, at, at that age to begin to talk to your kids about healthy biblical sexuality, where you don't go too far too fast. But you don't want to, like she's saying, you don't want to, we all know how bad it was when our parents, did, when we found out at school before mom and dad ever mentioned it, that doesn't, that doesn't go well, so we know not to do that. But, you, I mean, that might be something to cause you to look into some of those type things. And then when those questions come up, have those tools where you can have those conversations. Um, and hopefully, you in your neighborhood, you won't find men with tutus. I mean, that's probably not here a whole lot you see. But, but yeah, when, when you see things like that, I mean, I can't really explain that all the time, you know. So uh, it, it's tricky. I, I, I'm, I'm like her. I have a 24-year-old, so I, I, feel, I feel for you. So... Well, I'm in the throes of it, so the jury's out. But of the pink tutus? Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Clarification. Uh, I just, no. But I think I, th I mean I think it's the same. Like, parenting is both proactive and reactive, right? So proactively, you want them to handle, to know, to soak in, to see the truth through you, through the church, through. Uh, you know, home Bible studies, all those kinds of ways. You want them to know the truth so that when they see something odd, they say, that's not quite what I've seen or know. And then when they see something like that, um, so Melinda mentioned earlier that she homeschooled her kids. We don't, okay? Uh, that's not a, uh, you know, one's, I'm not saying one's right, one's wrong, but I'm saying our, uh, the way that we view it is our kids are going to go see things. And we, it's up to us to be, um, 
uh, to speak into their life what it is they're experiencing. Okay? Now, Melinda said the reason she did that was so that she could dole it out in a controlled environment. That's wise. That's very good. Um, and so it, what, what we're trying to do with our kids is, is they, they go out and they see things and, the, and we hear about it. They come and talk to us about it or we're aware of things that are going on in church or in the school or whatever. Then we immediately talk to them about these things. We show them from Scripture why, scripture why we believe what we believe. So in that, we teach them to go to the source um, we, my, you know, my, my eight year old autistic son asked me one day about, um, where babies come from. My philosophy is if he asks, I'm going to tell him. So we didn't, we didn't do analogies, birds and bees. We, we talked about stuff, you know, we talked about how it works. <laughs> um, and he said, okay. And walked away. So, <laughs> you know, so, like, oh, so, but, but I think, I think really the, 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 the main labor of it is the, the proactive discipling, <clears throat> like getting them to know and understand the word, getting them uh, to hear it on a regular basis and those kinds of things are, is the best form of defense. I was also going to say, um, I have four girls, my oldest is six, so we're kind of there with you with the, with the young ones. I've been working in an abortion ministry for about eight years. My kids naturally know what I do. I don't necessarily go into um, the, the facts about abortion. However, I always try to take situations like that and explain it to the gospel. Um, like, for instance, why would somebody have an abortion? Why would somebody want to do that? I, I usually try to, um, in those cases, I usually try to say, well, um, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, there are people who choose not to follow God in this world. That is why Christ died, for us to tell and for us to love. So, uh, you know, just to kind of, I, I agree with what everything they're saying, but I always, always think of an opportunity to present the gospel to my own children when seeing what's out in the world. Yes, sir. I, I would like for us to spend a few minutes if a couple of the pastors could explain what are you doing in your own churches to be ready for when people that are struggling with same-sex attraction, people that are living in a gay lifestyle do come. And I would like to then hear from Melinda's perspective of what can we be careful to do and to not do to, you know, help them and encourage them and and uh, want, help them to want to come back and hear truth and things like that. So, in Manville, our, our our whole approach is 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 a radical type of love ministry. We want to make sure that everybody who comes and who, who then becomes a part of the community experiences a, a love relationship with them within what we call a life group and a, and a growth group. So we want to make sure that they're connected well in. Uh, I'll, we'll go in order to try. Um, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, I mean, it, we, in our church, every week, I, I mean, as I sit in my church, I know that we hear the gospel in each service at least, at least three times. So uh, we, in the introduction, when we start the service, we're here to worship God. We're able to do that because of what Christ has done for us. And our, our, the men who, who lead us in prayer uh, regularly, without fail, pray the truths of the gospel. We hear it in song. I usually get it in my sermon. All those kinds of things. And the reason I say that is part of the gospel is we are all sinners, every one of us. And so uh, to, to lay that ground, uh, to help people to understand that, that all of us, all of us have sin issues. So when we have someone who comes in with that same-sex attraction, I would hope we would treat them in the same way that, that we would someone who uh, has, <coughs> wants to have a drink every night, you know, or, or, or someone who... Um, any number of sin, you just imagine. So we want to lay it flat and, and put ourselves in a, in a humble place to understand we all deal with this issue, and so we're not going to set it as a, a separate thing. Now, if we have someone who is 
like like we talked about earlier, gay affirming and and wants to be a Christian or wants to be a member of our church, then we cl set clear boundaries and we make those known by saying, look, we love you, uh, but we we don't believe that what the Bible teaches and what you're confessing line up. And so we want to say that to them in a loving manner. And so, I, I mean, it just, I think it happens through relationships, through all of us understanding our need before God, and uh, then all of us understanding what the Bible does teach on the issue. I would say the way that we embrace people is just, just exactly like these two guys said that you can first and foremost out of a, out of a radical love. Because if they don't see the love of God and the people of God, they're not going to want to stay around anyway. Um, but then to what he was saying too, I mean, you know, we're we're not all professional and, and in depth in every area. And so the, the reason we have people who have um, closer uh, ties to some of these things and have tools and knowledge and wisdom that we can share from is, is having, I've got a guy that I know, Glenn doesn't, um, that if I have somebody like that and, and they want to be counseled, then he can, he can either come and help me with that or guide me through that. And so knowing, you know, knowing those kind of tools and knowing that we can't be experts on every area, but knowing where we can go for those things and, and being prepared um, when that when that time comes or when it happens. So. Well, Asa, since he's pastor of the church I'm in, pretty much answered a lot of it, but, um, you know, insert whatever sin you're talking about. You know, we have people who have been, you know, they, they live together. They're not married. Uh, they're not members of our church, but we, they come in, their kids are in my cross kids. We teach them. I hug them. I love them. We talk and we, you know, where else are they going to hear the gospel? You know, where else are they going to be loved on? Uh, yes, membership is a totally different matter, but I mean, if a gay couple came in, come on to Bible study, I mean, the gay people that I know that have come to Christ, have, have been released from this bondage, they walked in as a couple, a lot of them did, walked into, a, sat in the back row of a church, they gradually would move up each Sunday, you know, a little closer if they weren't rejected, you know, and it was as, I mean, one of them that I know dearly, she she was one night at home with her partner reading the Bible, saw for herself in there after they'd been in a church for a long time. She just felt convicted to go. The partner just went with her, saw for herself in there what God said in the word. And she's like, oh, my gosh, we can't continue like this. I mean, it was the Holy Spirit that convicted them. And so, but you know, the, the, the ladies took them into their Bible study and their fellowships and everything. So, I mean, it's just all of us need the same thing. All of us need to grow closer to God. And God, it, the Holy Spirit is going to convict us. And so, yeah, we don't need to turn away people just because we, you know, it's like, check at the door, what's your sin? You know. Uh, you know, so, I mean, what? who else do we do that with? You know, so. Um, and I think having a biblically, biblically accurate, nuanced uh, understanding of the issue. So I think things like this help. Uh, I'm thankful that, that some of my church members are here uh, because some of them may not have known that I would sell flowers to a gay couple, but but, but now they but now they know. Uh, you know, and so that that those kind of, not that they just know about what I would do, but they get the idea of of uh, of how we might love someone, how how we might think through issues when we come across that. So I think um, you know just general. You gotta teach. You gotta, you gotta teach what the Bible says about the issue, and then what the Bible says about how we are to deal with people in general. So, if you look on on our website, I have my true freedom ministry here, and the big thing that I'm always stressing is the balance between truth and grace. You know, you can't have one without the other. You can't have too much truth without enough grace. You can't have too much grace without the truth, or you you've got problems. And I'm all I'm still learning how to balance that, uh, but I know it needs to be balanced. So I'm still praying, praying for wisdom and how to do that. Last question. Trey. Oh, this is a good one. one. Yeah, this is Melinda. This is Melinda. Um, through your, um, I guess, your, your experience, through your experience, um, did you find yourself learning from people 
people who are struggling, I mean, a woman or a man that was struggling in your same situation, did you, I don't know how I'm trying to ask, ask this question. So, are you asking her how she was counseled through or how she? Yeah, did she feel more, was it better learning from a male than a female perspective? In my particular case, I didn't really have anybody except God because he started it and he led me to some literature and stuff and then I eventually uh, worked with some women who one of them was actually a parent of a gay son. So she didn't have that exact information about how to counsel me. Uh, I just read a lot of stuff, but I mean, I think women helping women is good as long as the woman who is helping is, you know, doesn't have a problem with this, you know. Um, is that what you're looking for? I don't know if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, and, and like for the for the men, a lot of times, I mean, it can be anybody actually just coming alongside and loving and learning about them and befriending. Um, you know, sometimes guys can be threatened by another man. At least that's what they've told me uh, in the beginning. You know, and and sometimes that it's easier to talk to a woman um, as long as the woman is educated about things like that. But I would encourage them to befriend, you know, uh, straight men and find men who are, who are good and healthy in, in their own masculinity, their biblical masculinity. They don't always have to be jocks and, you know, athletes, but they, they need to be secure in their biblical masculinity and uh, and walk alongside of these, these men. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question. Um, it, it, yes, it is. <laughs> but what was really satisfying? Okay, yeah. But what was really neat with me was that that I really kept wanting someone to counsel me. I was not counseled. God, I mean, I sort of was in little doses, but God just kind of plopped all this in my lap, and and I, it was me and God for like two years just digging in, and, and uh, he he had his thumb on me, and really, you know, so I. For anybody who's interested, my testimony is written on a uh, sheet of paper out on the bar, and y'all can pick it up and read more detail than I can tell you here. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, we'll come on you. Okay. Yeah, sure. You were. My question is this: I, yeah, I'm probably getting on a lot, but my question is this. right now we're seeing children that are cross-dressing in these school systems. Is that part of your home? Is that I know it's in the family, but how do we, right and wrong, I got that, but that's something that's totally like messing me up. Cross-dressing is messing you up, or yeah. they understand? This is a little bit, parents are around with their children, but they probably hear that God was wrong with their sex choice. And that's part of the deception, and I, that, my heart breaks up with that. Um, yes, okay. I know, if my heart breaks, I don't know, it, it's a parental... You know, parents thinking they're doing something good for their child when they, they've been deceived. Yeah. Um, it, it's a part of sin nature. Uh, I'm preaching this week on Isaiah chapter 5 where it talks about um, one of the woes, one of the one of the sins that God uh, is is confronting Israel with was the fact that they call what is evil good and what is good evil. Um, uh, and so uh, you're, you're going to see that in society. That's, that's a part of what we are. So what we must do is stand for what is good, even when it's unpopular. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to be we're going to deal with that, and we might and we, and we might be rightfully repulsed by it. But that doesn't mean we can't love the people who are in it. Yeah. Patrick, Patrick, close this out, brother. So when you have a church member um, that, that is involved in your body, and they this issue is completely the polar opposite. Of you know being a homophobe as, as we describe it and different things like what is the proper way to deal with that individual um, or family or whatever um, when, when that is starting to cause that division take a stand biblically on how this here and, and you know uh, being enlightened how this looks like what do you do when you have church church uh, church members that um, are not in line with that what's the best way to handle it and even from a you know children's ministry perspective. With, with parents, they're like, this kid is kind of, you know, he's a fifth grader, but he's acting, you know, 
a little different and you can kind of see some tendencies in there and they don't want their kid around them. So how do you probably deal with those kinds of things? Okay. Is your question, is it two? Like, yes, so yeah. so yes. one is, how do you deal with a church member who comes out of the gate? Is that no, the, they are the, the church member who has, has, this is really dead set on, we're not going to accept this person here. They can't come to our church. This is a foundation type mentality. You confront them as pride and tell them that that is not what the scripture teaches. So they're doing the exact same thing as the people they're hating. They're denying scripture. So uh, we don't, uh, we don't hate people because of their sin. Uh, so, so we don't do that for other things. Uh, we, we don't hate the, the, the young man who spends 10 hours between video games and pornography. We don't hate him. Uh, in fact, we might even identify with him. Uh, we don't, uh, so, so we would say uh, that they are standing in a biblical manner. We would confront them in their sin. To the children ministry question, about the same thing. I would talk to the parents and say, This is not what scripture says. I mean, you know, the children are children, the poor children, gosh, I'm just, I think, for them, um, the ones who are being told that they're gay and they're, they're going, you know, and then acting on that. Um, I would definitely talk to the parents and just have a heart to heart with them. Same thing Asa said. This is not what Scripture teaches. You know, to to single out one child for this or the other. Um, so a follow-up question to that I guess would be: So when, if you see a child, or in my case, a student, uh, a teenager, or whatever, and you start to see some things there, maybe a parent is in denial or whatever, how do you start to kind of deal with that and kind of open up their eyes and say, "Hey, I see this this sin thing. I see this going on." And how do you approach that with a parent? You start to know. Obviously, they're going to know. A parent knows. But I mean, what is the best way to approach them? I mean, I, in ten years of youth ministry, I've never, I've never encountered it. I probably have, but haven't noticed it. You know, I know I've encountered, but haven't noticed it. So, I mean, I wouldn't say anything to the child, to the person. I mean, in that regard. I mean, unless they're actually like starting to engage with someone else. You know, but I mean, just because you see tendencies or something. Well, uh, you know. and, and as far as parents as well, you wouldn't say anything. Not unless I saw, like, like I say, they may be engaging in a relationship with someone else, uh, just because they're showing tendencies that you think are are, are gay or not. I mean, because that doesn't always hold water. I mean, you've got very effeminate men who are straight. You've got very masculine women who are straight. You know, and and you have women who look like Barbie who are lesbian. You know, so you really. That's not something you even want to, as a, as a child who was, who was very tomboyish, you know, I had some people who made comments that, you know, lesbian or, or you know, whatever, and butch and things like that. And that that just further pushed me along thinking that I w actually was. So, uh, you know, where if I'd been affirmed as straight on, like, like for my athleticism and that's just what girls do, that'd be great. That would have helped me a lot more. So, I mean, I wouldn't call that out in a child at all. You know, just treat them like anybody else. But, yeah, I mean, I, and, and, and encourage the parent to do the same. Yeah. A church can cross the line, or people in a church can cross the line to be hypervigilant. So I think you need to deal with sins that present and not assume sins. Um, so until, until someone engages in a sin, uh, you can teach on it. You can do all kinds of things, but you never... Uh, you're never looking for the boogie scene. You know what I mean? Like, you just deal with what's over there. There's plenty to do. <laughs> boogie scene. That's a new one. Line it up. It's getting late. Yeah, it's getting late. It's you way past the bedtime, too, guys. So, uh, and he hasn't had Starbucks in four hours. So, uh, now, with that one, we're going to close down, guys. Thank you again for attending, uh, for the great questions uh, that you asked. Uh, a couple of brief announcements. Uh, one, uh, if you like these conversations, uh, Enlighten will be uh, returning again in the fall. Uh, we don't have a hard date set or even a topic yet, but pay attention to our Facebook page uh, with Crossroads Church. If you haven't liked us yet, go ahead and like us now. Uh, that way you'll be kept in the loop on other things that are coming up as well.
the second thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is on April 24th, Friday night at 6.30, uh, we will be doing Secret Church here again at Crossroads. And a lot of what we talked about uh, will be talked about that night. It's Christ, culture, and a call to action. David Platt will be uh, teaching uh, on a lot of the cultural issues that we have covered in these Enlightened series so far uh, over the past six months. So uh, I definitely <coughs> encourage you and invite your friends uh, to sign up for that. Uh, more of that will be detailed on our website, uh, on our website and our Facebook page uh, next week. So be, uh, keep that in mind. I would like to encourage you. Don't let this discussion stop here. Go to your, if you're a member of a church and you're in small groups, carry on the conversation there. Talk to your pastors if uh, if you uh, if you need to have more questions answered. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Inform yourself on these issues so that uh, you will be prepared when God opens the door uh, for you to, to have that conversation. So, uh, panelists, thank you uh, again uh, for coming uh, this time. Uh, oh, no, 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 it's not, it's now Father Thomas. So, so, uh, so uh, Father Thomas, would you please uh, close us in prayer? In my praying for you, Jay. Uh, so I can get out of here without you catching me. All right. Father, we just, we come in and, and, and thank you for letting us be in your presence tonight together, God. We thank you for your, your grace and your mercy. And we do thank you for your truth, God, that leads us into light and that gives us new life. And God, we thank you that we have churches like this that are not afraid to talk about things that are right in front of us and in our culture and all around us and, and permeating everything that we do bring them in light of the gospel and, and to show that um, the gospel is still the truth and uh, that it does not change with the culture God. this this too shall pass uh, Father, as they say so I just pray that um, as we leave here that we um, just have a, a new awareness of, of just all the people around us who are, are broken and hurting even father when they may act as though um, everything is good God just cause that to, for us to bear down and God, just look for opportunities to be Christ and to submit ourselves to love our enemies, God, and even those that don't agree with us. To be a servant to all the way Jesus came from heaven and lowered himself and served man. And God, that we might be um, we might be Christ to those that don't not, that know not him yet. And for those who God may have been driven away um, by people that didn't understand didn't react correctly with the gospel, that we'd be able to be repairers of those kind of things, reconcilers of those things uh, with the power of the gospel. Father, we do ask the, just for the Holy Spirit to be our guide in all these conversations and actions and, and to help us with, with the love that we need to, to give out to people, for them to even be attracted or think about wanting to come near a church, Father. And we ask for that. And we ask for your wisdom in all these things. And we just, as a body of Christ, we, Father, we repent, God, for where we've gone wrong and where we've not handled these things right, God. And Father, just help us to help us to, be, to paint an accurate picture of, of who Christ is, and uh, to be uh, just to be a powerful relevance in our in our culture. And, uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name.